Hi and welcome to module 9.6 of Digital Signal Processing. This is our last module in our data communication section and with everything that we've learned so far we will be able to look inside an ADSL modem and see how that works. We will start by examining the nature of the channel that ADSL works on, namely the copper wire that links your home to the nearest central office we will look at the signaling strategy that is best put in place on such a channel. And finally, we will look at a very efficient implementation of that signaling strategy that goes under the name of discrete multitone modulation. If we just take an abstract view of the telephone network today, we see that we have a link that goes from the home to the central office. And in the central office, a fundamental split takes place. The voice communication, when you talk on the phone, is sent to the voice network and then relayed to the what is called the plain old telephone system, POTS. The data part of your communication when you use the ADSL is separated from the voice content and sent to a DSLAM. DSLAM stands for Digital Subscriber Line Access Multiplier and it's fundamentally a bank of modems that manage to handle multiple communications at the same time. And the data here then goes on to the internet in digital format. So if you want, what we're really interested in is how to send the data from your home to the central office because what happens afterwards is already entirely in the digital domain. But here we have what is called the last mile, a piece of copper wire, namely an analog channel, that connects your home to the central office. Now, a copper wire has naturally a very large bandwidth in excess of 1 megahertz, but because of the width of the bandwidth and because the wire is not shielded, it is actually likely to pick up a lot of interference and noise. If we look at how the ADSL channel is organized, and we're showing here just the positive frequencies, we can see three distinct regions. The first one is the part reserved to the telephone conversation. This is a baseband part of the channel up to about 4 kilohertz. Then we have a region that is devoted to the upstream part of the data communication, the data that you send up to the internet, and then a downstream part that is much larger that is used for data download. This asymmetry between upstream and downstream is actually the reason why the communication protocol is called ADSL. ADSL stands for Asymmetric Digital Subscriber Line. If we now look at all the nasty things that can happen on the channel when we send data, we can identify three fundamental sources of worry. The first one is an attenuation curve for the channel that is completely uneven. This could be due to imperfection in the wire, parasitic capacitance, and so on and so forth. Then we might have very large noise or interference in certain regions of the spectrum. For instance, you turn on your vacuum cleaner and that raises the noise floor in a certain frequency band. And thirdly, we have very localized interference from radio communication. Now, the radio band starts well within the bandwidth of the ADSL channel. For instance, from 15 to 100 kilohertz here, you have ship-to-shore communication. Up to 500 kilohertz, you have airplane communication. And over 500 kilohertz, you have the AM radio band. So if you live near a radio station, for instance, tough luck, you have a lot of interference in the upper regions of the ADSL band. Since the channel is so wide and the type of disturbances so diverse, it would be extraordinarily difficult to try to equalize and compensate for these problems on a global scale. So the idea, instead, is to divide the channel into independent subchannels and treat each subchannel separately. So here, for instance, this channel that contains a highly localized uh, radio frequency interference would probably not even be used because it would be too difficult to compensate for this. Here on these channels, the noise level is different, and so, for instance, we would use different signaling strategy according to the local signal-to-noise ratio. And similarly here, for channels that have a very large attenuation, probably it wouldn't be worthwhile to try and send data over these things. But on the other hand, we will try to exploit the cleanest subchannels to send a maximum amount of data. Now, to formalize the subchannel structure, suppose that we want to allocate n subchannels over the total positive bandwidth. We want the subchannels to have equal bandwidth, so their bandwidth will be f max over n, where f max is the maximum frequency allowed for by the channel. And we equally space the subchannels by centering them over k f max over n, with k that goes from 0 to big N minus 1. This means that the first channel k equal to 0, will be baseband, 
and then the subsequent channels will be passband with center frequencies given by this formula. Now we want to translate this design to the digital domain, so we pick a sampling frequency that is at least twice the maximum frequency in the channel, but careful now because F max is quite high. The center frequency for each subchannel will be omega k equal to 2 pi kf max over n divided by the sampling frequency. And if we sample at the Nyquist frequency, so fs is equal to twice f max, then omega k becomes simply 2 pi over 2n times k. We will not simplify the 2s in the fraction because they will be useful later. The bandwidth of each subchannel is also 2 pi over 2n. And so if we want to send symbols over any of these subchannels, remember the modulation scheme that we've seen in the previous modules, then we will have to use an upsampling factor k that is at least 2n. If we plot the result in the digital domain, let's suppose that we just want to have three subchannels, we have something that looks like this. The center frequencies will be multiples of 2 pi over 6, so we'll have 0, 2 pi over 6 and 4 pi over 6, and we will center channels over these frequencies, and the bandwidth of each channel will be 2 pi over 6. So the first channel is the baseband channel, and then we have two passband channels with, of course, their negative frequency counterpart. The next step in ADSL communication is to put a QAM modem on each subchannel independently. And we will decide on the data rate for each modem based on the signal to noise ratio of each subchannel. So if the noise floor is low, then we will have a large constellation for that subchannel and vice versa. On channels that are unusable because of noise of interference, we will just send zeros and we will not care about that. The structure of the signaling scheme is, of course, going to be communicated from the transmitter to the receiver so that the receiver knows where to expect data. This is part of the handshaking procedure between transmitter and receiver. Now let's look more in detail at the structure of the modem that we use on each subchannel. This is a classic modulation scheme where we start with a sequence of symbols as produced by the mapper. Then we have an upsampling by a factor of 2n, so inserting 2n minus 1 zeros every other sample, and then filtering the sequence with a low pass, usually a raised cosine, with a cutoff frequency 2 pi over 2n in this case. This produces the complex baseband signal bk of n, and this complex baseband signal gets modulated with a complex exponential whose frequency is indexed by the channel number. And this is the center frequency of each channel. Omega ck is equal to 2 pi over 2n times k. And here we have, finally, the passband signal that fits the prescribed bandwidth of the kth channel. And normally, if we just had one channel, we would put here a block that computes the real part and then our D2A converter. But here we have several modems in parallel, and so we have a structure that looks like this. Each channel will have two things that vary with respect to the others. The frequency of the modulation and, of course, the series of symbols produced by the mapper. We sum all the complex baseband signals together before taking the real part and then sending the signal to the D2A converter. Now, this picture should ring a bell, and indeed we have seen something that was very, very close to this back in module 4.3. So here's the picture to jog your memory, and remember we said the DFT reconstruction formula could be interpreted as a bank of n oscillators. Each oscillator would operate at a frequency that was 2 pi over n times k, and we would scale each oscillator with an amplitude, a of k, and with the phase offset phi of k, we would run this machine for big N samples, and we would get our signal out. Now, the difference between this scheme and what we just saw is fundamentally that in this scheme, A of k and phi of k are kept constant for the whole duration of the generation process. So, while N goes from 0 to big N minus 1, A of k and phi of k stay the same. Whereas in the modem scheme that we've seen before, the symbol sequence, which is a complex symbol sequence so embeds both magnitude and phase, will change at each new value of n. So is there a way to map the modem structure to the inverse DFT structure? 
We can do that if we manage to find a way to keep the symbols constant over the whole duration of the upsampling period. So we will show how to do that, and we will show that if we manage to do that, then ADSL transmission can be efficiently implemented with simply an inverse FFT. The name of this technique is discrete multitone modulation. So the great ADSL trick is very simple. Instead of using a race cosine in the upsampler, let's use a bad filter, simply the indicator function for the interval 0 to 2n minus 1, and see what happens. So the impulse response of the upsampling filter is now this one, and please notice that this is just an unnormalized moving average filter. And the frequency response, of course, is this one. We have seen it many times before, with the first zero here in pi over n. If we compare the frequency response of the moving average, if you want, or the indicator function, with that of the filter that we should be using, namely a low-pass filter with cutoff pi over 2n, then we see that the performance of the filter is not very good. Nonetheless, the thing will work, especially thanks to some clever little tricks in the way we choose the transmission symbols, but we will not have time to go into that. So let's go back to the subchannel modem. The thing to remark here is that the symbols from the mapper come in at a rate of B symbols per second. And because of the upsampling, samples out of the modulator come out at a rate of 2 and B samples per second. So this part works much faster than this part here. Now the carrier is periodic with period 2n. And so each symbol will influence a full period of the carrier. If we use a standard low-pass filter here, for every value of n here, so for every value of the carrier, there will be a different value in this baseband sequence that comes out of the sampler. On the other hand, if we use the indicator function as the impulse response, the net result is that the values of bk of n will be constant over chunks of 2n samples. In that case, we can simplify this whole scheme like so, where now the only clock in the system is the output clock, n. So now the oscillator in the modulator runs freely at a frequency which is a multiple of 2 pi over 2n. This frequency is periodic with period 2n, so, and for each chunk of 2n samples, we go look for the symbol that corresponds to this interval. So if, say, n is equal to 0 here, n is equal to 2n here, n is equal to 4n here, and n is equal to 6n here, for this interval, we will go look for a of 0 and multiply this portion of the carrier by this value. Here we'll, we'll look for a of 1, here a of 2, and so on and so forth. So with this simplification, the whole transmitter can be sketched like so. We have the symbols from different subchannels that get multiplied by the carrier and kept constant over intervals of 2n output samples. The whole thing gets summed together, we get the aggregate bandpass signal, we take the real part and we're ready for the D2A converter. We can now write explicitly the formula for the aggregate bandpass signal CN, and this is the sum over all subchannels of the symbol for that subchannel or for that interval multiplied by e to the j 2 pi over 2 n n k. Now, because of the way the index to the AK sequence is computed, these symbols will stay constant over intervals for the output index that are 2n long. So, for instance, for small n that goes from 0 to 2n minus 1, these values will stay constant. And again, for values of the output index that go from 2n to 4n minus 1. So we could compute two big n values for the sequence Cn in one fell swoop if we exploit the fact that this guy looks remarkably like an inverse DFT. As a matter of fact, by looking at the argument here, we can say that this is almost an inverse DFT over two big N points. The two things that are missing are the normalizing factor in front, 1 over 2n, and the terms in the sum for the index k that goes from n to 2n minus 1. 
but that's not a problem. We can supplement those elements, and so we can compute a chunk of two big N output samples in one go as the inverse DFT over two endpoints of a vector that is given by N channel symbols and has another big N zeros appended to the end of it. The index for the subchannel symbols is given by the value of the output index divided by 2n, and we take the integer part. But we can do even better, because in the end, remember, we're interested in the real part of the vector c of n. And we can write that real part as c of n plus the conjugate of c of n divided by 2. Now, it is easy to prove, and it's left as an exercise, that the conjugate of the inverse DFT of a vector is equal to the inverse DFT of the conjugate of the time-reversed vector. And when we time-reverse a finite-length vector, it's useful to think of the periodic extension. With this result, and knowing that c of n is equal to 2n times the inverse DFT of a vector that is zeros in its latter part, we can sum cn with its conjugate to obtain that the real part of cn is equal to n times the inverse dft of a vector that is given by twice the symbol for the baseband subchannel. The reason why we can write this is because the baseband signal will always have real valued symbols, because it's baseband, followed by the complex symbols for the n minus 1 remaining subchannels, followed by the conjugate of the symbols for the n minus 1 remaining subchannels, but going from channel n minus 1 to channel 1. Schematically, we can draw up the ADSL transmitter as one big inverse FFT, and the inputs to this FFT are twice the baseband symbol, followed by the symbols for the subchannels from 1 to n minus 1, and then we take these values, we conjugate them, and we flip their order, and we put those in the remaining inputs of the FFT. Now we run the inverse FFT, and we get two n output samples in one go. We use a parallel to serial device to output the samples one at a time, and here we have our D2A converter to put them on the channel. Once the n samples have been put out, we go back, we fetch another set of n symbols from the n mappers of the subchannels, and we repeat the process. An actual ADSL modem uses a maximum frequency for the channel of 1104 kHz, divides this channel into 256 subchannels. Each QAM modem for the subchannel can independently choose between 0 and 15 bits per symbol. Now the first seven channels are left off because that is the band used by the voice communication over the telephone channel. Channels 7 to 31 are used for data upstream and the rest is left for data downstream for a maximum theoretical throughput of 14.9 megabits per second. This would happen if all the downstream subchannels could use their maximum theoretical rate, which is a rare occurrence. And these are the specs of the online modem that you most probably used to watch this online class.